he was waiting for me there, just off the hiking trail in the woods behind my house. He leaned against a tree, his eyes closed, his expression serene. He wore a neatly pressed black suit and a crisp top hat that would have been out of style 30 years ago. Something about the sight of him, maybe his inappropriate attire, was deeply unnerving. Instinctively, I took a step backwards, and a twig broke beneath my foot. At the sound, his eyes snapped open. Those eyes piercing and blue held my gaze like a hook in a fish's mouth. A subtle, cat-like smile played at the corner of his lips. I've been waiting for you, he said, his voice quiet and smooth as velvet. I could feel my hackles rise, but my legs had turned to lead. I'm sorry, I said. I think you must have me confused with somebody else. There was a brief flash of something, contempt maybe, across his face, but before I could seize on it, it was gone. I don't get confused, the man said. I'm exactly where I want to be, exactly when I want to be there. Do you understand that? I nodded dumbly, alarm bells clang in my head, my animal brain screaming danger, and yet, I could not tear my gaze away. I sought you out here, the man said, because I need you to do me a favor. What? Don't talk, just listen, he snapped. His anger flashed through my brain as a red hot bolt of pain, but it faded as quickly as it had come and he slid back into his easy, composed demeanor. The sunlight caught in his bright blue eyes and danced there in whimsical gaiety. He raised a long, white finger in front of his face, and I noticed that the nail was nearly half an inch long, thick, and milky yellow. He tapped the tip of the finger to his chin as he spoke. An old friend and I have a long-standing game, he said. It's a bit like hide-and-seek, you could say. He hides and I seek. Are you following me so far? I nodded again. Good, he said. Well, thanks to several enterprising assistants such as yourself, I have found him again. And I'd like very much to win the game before he goes scurrying off into those little rat holes again. He slid one of his long, thin hands into the inside pocket of his suit jacket and produced what looked like a very old and very ugly toy. It was a polished dark wood figure carved into the likeness of a twisted bat-like creature. He held it out on top of his open palm. Take it, he said. As I approached him, my legs seemed to resist my course. Every step was like dragging a 30-pound weight behind each foot. I reached down to take the wooden idol, and for a moment, the tips of my fingers brushed against his skin. It radiated a hateful warmth and my own skin crawled up into revulsive goosebumps. When I looked back into his eyes, they seemed to grow to dominate my entire field of vision. Now listen very carefully, he said. You are going to do exactly as I say. I listened. I was at the address the man had given me, the hateful little idol resting in my pocket. It seemed much too heavy for its size, and no matter how long I held it in my hand, it was always cold. My thoughts were swirling and broken, dancing away like shadows from the light of my consciousness. The only one that I could focus on was an instinct that emanated from somewhere in the back of my brain, the part born well before conscious thought had ever evolved. The instinct said that if I did not complete my task successfully, the man in the force was going to hurt me, and very, very badly. I approached the door and wrapped it with my knuckles. I heard the scurry of footsteps and the click that sounded like a shotgun cock. No solicitors, called the voice behind the door. I took a deep breath and carefully repeated the words the suit man had taught me. Modok Erder. There was a moment where nothing happened, and then the door swung open into darkness and a man dressed in a cassock of a Catholic priest ushered me inside. He held a shotgun in his right hand. The door slammed shut behind me, 
and I heard the click and slide of no less than three locks. The priest's face was pale and lined with worry that hid behind false composure. What news do you bring? He asked. He's outside the city, I said, repeating the carefully rehearsed words. He plans to destroy this building with a bomb. The priest clicked his tongue. A bomb? He said. But he knows that a bomb would only kill the priest. What use would that be? He plans to flush you out, I said. He has a trap waiting for you on the road. The priest's face grew grave. Tell me about this trap. I shook my head. No, I said. Not you. The priest seemed to understand. He gripped me by the arm and led me down the hallway with swift, long steps. He opened the door to a small, dark room, and as we stepped over the threshold, my leg exploded with fury pain. The idol in my pocket was radiating some sort of hateful energy. I could feel it coursing up and down my leg like electricity. The room was candlelit, and only a trifle brighter than the near total darkness of the hallway. Behind an oblong obsidian table sat an old man dressed in a ragged robe of white cloth. His hair and beard were pure white, and both hung down below his navel. Lining the walls of the office were various religious talismans and icons. Some of them I recognized. The crucifix, a St. Christopher's medallion, an Egyptian ink. Yet some of them were fantastic and strange. Ranging from iron shields bearing jewel encrypted symbols, to elephant tusks covered in cuneiform script, to desiccated fingers that looked not quite human. The old man slowly rose, regarding me with a wary look. I know you not, he said. There was a sharp intake of breath from the priest at my elbow. From the corner of my eye, I saw him raise the shotgun. I plunged my hand into my pocket and seized the idol. As my fingers closed around it, I felt as if every bone in my hand was simultaneously shattered. I hurled it at the old man and it struck him in the forehead, releasing a shockwave that knocked us all to the ground and shook the talismans from the walls. I heard the blast of the shotgun, and when I sat up, I saw what the priest had fired at. The man from the forest stood in the center of the room, blue eyes flickering with mild amusement as he looked down at the priest. That small, cat-like smile crept across his lips as he watched the priest fumble in his cassock for another shotgun shell and slide it into the open bowl. The priest fired, and the man smiled wider. There was not a mark on him. He leaned down towards the priest, hands on knees, his face like that of a kindly older gentleman gently chiding a rebunctious child. I'm going to kill you now, he said. Faster than I would have believed, his hands darted out, seizing the priest by the throat. Thick black revolts of blood pulsed from where his fingers pierced the flesh. Then, with a sickly wet ripping sound, he tore out the priest's throat and tossed it aside like a piece of trash. Hot arterial blood sprayed my face. The old man lay behind the desk, struggling to rise. He had a red mark on his forehead where the idol had struck. Blood still dripping from his fingernails, the suit man from the forest approached the old man. His voice was barely above a whisper when he said, I win. He seized the old man's head and twisted it and the neck broke with the sound like a broom handle snapping in half. He leaned down and picked something up off the ground and dangled it between his thumb and forefinger. It looked like a deformed bat, slimy with black blood. It was shrieking a high, careening cry, half the mewling sob of a baby, half the scream of lamb being led to slaughter. He walked it over to me and dangled it in front of my face and I recognized it as the wooden idol. Ah, he said, our recently deceased friend certainly has grown powerful over the years. Just look how big the tonic is. I realized that the man's eyes were no longer blue. No, now they were yellow and reptilian. The thing squirmed in his touch. It sank its teeth into his finger and scrambled furiously at him with its claws. 
He grinned at me to reveal rows of razor sharp conical teeth, yellow and stained with decay. He grasped the tonic in his fist and ripped off its head with his teeth. The bones of the skull gave way with a sickening crunch. He grinned at me again, and I saw a pink serpentine tongue flickering between his blood-stained teeth. I know you'll never understand the significance of what you've done here today, he said, but you've helped me out a great deal. I always repay a favor. Open your mouth. My jaw involuntarily clenched so hard, I thought I felt a tooth crack. The man simply laughed and seized my jaw in his deceptively strong fingers, squeezing it open. He upended the headless creature over my mouth, letting a few drops of black blood fall onto my tongue. Blazing white pain seared through my nerves, and the world disappeared into merciful unconsciousness. When I awoke, the man was gone. My clothes were soaked through with sweat, and my throat was raw as if I had been screaming for hours. The talismans that littered the floor of the office glowed with a painful white light. My body felt like rubber as I staggered my feet and stumbled out of the office into the waiting daylight. My life has changed tremendously since that day. I can no longer go within a block of a church without feeling an overpowering urge to vomit. When people pass me on the street wearing crosses, the holy talisman scream at me with a searing, painful white light. But there are benefits too. My muscles have been endowed with a lithe, serpentine strength. The injury in my lower back has disappeared, and I can smell people's emotions on them. But the most striking change by far has been my hunger, if you can call it that. It feels like an itch inside the back of my skull that constantly craves scratching. I don't know what I need to feed it. Perhaps more of what the man fed me from the tonic's neck. But with each passing day, I feel the itch grow stronger, scattering my thoughts like seeds on the wind. And now, in concert, with the strengthening of the itch, a sweet scent has begun to drift towards me on the wind from far away. I can only catch it in brief snatches, but it smells like flowers and perfume like fresh fruit and honey, like sweet, rotting meat and maggots. Most of all, it smells like food 